It is an unprecedented move made by an equally, well, the illogical president. The U.S. President Donald Trump has, for the first time in history, blacklisted the army of another country, naming it a terrorist organization, namely Iran's IRGC. Iran's reaction has been quick and swift, returned the favor in kind. In this edition of the debate, we will look at the ramifications of this U.S. move, which even went against U.S. Army officials, apparently a gift from the U.S. President to the current Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Iran's Islamic Revolution Guards Corps, IRGC, was established in April 1979 under a decree by the late founder of Islamic Republic, Imam Khomeini. The goal was to safeguard the country's Islamic Revolution less than three months after its victory. The IRGC was tasked with helping protect national security through hunting anti-revolution elements inside cities and fighting armed terrorist groups, particularly those in border provinces. The IRGC also helped defend the country alongside the army during the eight-year war imposed by Iraq. Iran's Islamic Revolution Guards Corps further expanded in 1990 after Basij and Quds forces were added to it under a decree by leader of Iran's Islamic Revolution, Ayatollah Said Ali Khamenei. Over the past years, the IRGC has maintained its role in protecting national security in the face of internal and external threats. The organization has also cooperated in fighting terrorism outside of Iran, including in Iraq and Syria. The IRGC is tasked with increasing the number of its troops through recruiting and training individuals from among ordinary people. The organization is also tasked with carrying out research activities aimed at helping Iran in self-defense and attaining self-sufficiency in military fields. The IRGC has fulfilled the aims by developing a number of light and heavy weapons, including missiles, over the past years. In non-military fields, the force has also fulfilled its duty to cooperate with the government in construction development projects. The IRGC says its aim is to help the oppressed whenever they are. Our guest joining us for this edition of the debate, editor and publisher at Politics First, Marcus Papadopoulos, joins us from London. Uh, Marcus Papadopoulos, welcome. Why do you think the U.S. has decided at this time to put Iran's Islamic Revolution Guard Corps on its foreign terrorist organization list? What does the U.S. hope to gain out of this? Well, let me say this first of all, that Donald Trump's decision to designate Iran's Revolutionary Guards as a terrorist organization is um, disrespectful, it is illogical, it is reckless, and quite frankly, it is idiotic. And it will only result in an escalation of tension between America and Iran, and thereby an escalation of tension in the Middle East in general. And who are the beneficiaries? Well, in my mind, it's not really America who is the beneficiary of this decision. It's actually Israel and Saudi Arabia. Now, why has Trump taken this decision? Well, I think a major factor in accounting for his decision is the fact that Trump is beholden to both Israel and Saudi Arabia. If we just take Israel, Israel played a very important role in Donald Trump's uh, election victory in 2016. And therefore, he is now repaying the Israelis, in particular Benjamin Netanyahu, he's repaying them with favors. So first of all, um, uh, Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. He then recognized the occupied Golan as part of Israel. And he has now recognized the Iran's Revolutionary Guards as a terrorist organization. Now, that is quite a gift to the Israelis. And also the timing of the latter, recognizing Iran's uh, Revolutionary Guards as a terrorist one, because of course, as I speak, there are presidential elections in Israel. So uh, Mr. Netanyahu can say to the um, Israeli electorate that because of my presidency, we now have the um, we now have Iran's revolutionary guards, which in quotation marks pose a terrible threat to Israeli security and a terrible threat to the welfare safety of Israeli civilians. We now have that um, organization designated as a terrorist one because of, of uh, Mr. 
Netanyahu's relationship with Trump. And I suspect that this decision of Trump will go down well with the uh, Israeli electorate. And therefore, probably more Israelis will now be inclined to vote for Mr. Netanyahu because of this decision. Okay, let me introduce Ian Williams, Senior Analyst of Foreign Policy and Focus. He joins us from New York. Ian Williams, welcome. Michael Pompeo, in his uh, statements when he made this announcement, said the IRGC is not only facilitating but perpetrating terrorism, participates in finances and promotes terrorism as a tool of statecraft. The move will deprive the world's leading state sponsor of terror, the financial means to spread misery and death. Do you agree with him? Certainly not. Um, the man is, well, I would like to say he's an idiot, but this is carefully crafted idiocy. And uh, like uh, Mark just said, it's about politics and it's about getting the support of large Israeli supporters in the U.S. for Trump and the Republican Party in the next election. And incidentally, to give support to Netanyahu, because Trump thinks of himself first. That's what it's all about. This is a political gesture for the domestic market and for the Israeli market. And, of course, the Saudis will be very happy with it as well. But it's, I think it's, it's almost reassuring that the signs from Washington is that people in the State Department and the Pentagon and other U.S. departments are rolling their eyes at this and thinking it's a stupid and counterproductive decision. Because where will it end here? Mossad is a terrorist organization. Uh, the CIA is a terrorist organization. These are state organizations that have organized uh, assassinations, that have organized explosions, that have uh, arranged coups across the world. Um, Mossad has a track record of assassinating people, uh, its, its opponents, and sometimes accidentally other people, like the poor Norwe the Moroccan waiter in, Nor in Norway. Um, there's a long track record here, and if this means that they can be designated as terrorist organizations, then I'm presuming <clears throat> that Iran and other people will take steps to do so. Um, you know, if, you've got the, if you have the SAS, if they, land in a, if they land in a place to disrupt a foreign country, to arrange sabotage or disruption, they're a terrorist organization on this definition. And part of the problem of this is that terrorism is as, as long as you want it to be. Terrorism is something that uh, it, it does not introduce clarity into discussions. A terrorist is somebody who commits acts of violence for a cause that I disagree with. That's what a terrorist is. Every other definition is sort of hey, is is hovering around. Air Force pilots who drop bombs on civ on civilian on targets with civilians in they're terrorists if they did it as a plainclothes person driving in with a truck full of bombs. That makes them a terrorist, but dropping them from a height, from 30,000 feet with a missile, that clears you? I don't think so. People do not think clearly. Once terrorism is introduced, the whole purpose is to stop people thinking clearly mm -hmm. and to follow, your, to, to, to follow your dictates, where your finger go, is pointing. Okay. Marcus Papadopoulos, we have the Pentagon and other military officials uh, that have advised or had advised uh, Donald Trump against this move, something that has been mulled by the U.S. actually for, uh, according to some reports, for uh, 10 years now. But the U.S. never exercised this type of decision. Uh, one of the reasons it says is that they voice concerns about the uh, close proximity of U.S. troops in Syria, for example, to Iranian forces. We could also talk about uh, the presence of U.S. Uh, forces in uh, the Persian Gulf area. Uh, how, how, how much of a risk is there now for this to perhaps take a military turn? Though I must say that the U.S. has reiterated the fact that this is not, this does not mean that we're going to target Iranian soldiers, for example. Well, I think that what you said is correct. I don't believe that this decision of Trump is going to result in a military confrontation between America and Iran. Indeed, I believe that there is more intelligence in the Pentagon and in the State Department than what there is in the White House. I believe that Trump really is 
an imbecile, but he puts himself first. Whoever has helped him to become president will be repaid in full. It's not just Israel, it's Saudi Arabia as well. So in April 2017, just a few months into Trump's presidency, Mr. Trump went to Saudi Arabia and signed arms contracts with the Saudis to the tune of approximately $500 billion. Now, why won't there be a military confrontation between America and Iran? Or should I say, why won't America instigate a military crusade against Iran? Because I think the Americans are acutely aware that the Iranian military is extremely powerful. It is very large. It is very well led. It is very well motivated. It is very well equipped. And also the Americans will look to the Iraq-Iran Iraq, war and will conclude that in a fight with Iran, it wouldn't, the Americans wouldn't just be up against the Iranian military, they would be up against millions of Iranians volunteering to fight at the front line, because that is exactly what the Iranians did um, following Saddam Hussein's criminal and murderous invasion of Iran. But there is another point here. I think that there, are, there is a, a growing audience in America and also in Britain comprised of people who are questioning what they have been told about Iran over the last 40 years. And by designating Iran's Revolutionary Guards as a terrorist organization is a way of trying to strangle that discussion. And I think it is very important for people to spread the message in both America and Britain that Iran's Revolutionary Guards have fought against terrorism in Syria. They have helped to defend Christians in Syria against massacres from uh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards have helped to defend Christian communities, helped defend churches and monasteries. For example, in Malula, after Malula, the only place in the world where the language of Jesus Christ, Aramaic, is spoken, after Malula was liberated from uh, terrorist control, who helped to defend Malula after the Syrian army moved on? Moved on. It was both Hezbollah and Iran's Revolutionary Guards. Now, given that Britain and America are Christian countries, historically and predominantly Christian countries, that is a very powerful message to send to ordinary British people and ordinary Americans that the Iranian Revolutionary Guards have helped to defend these Christian community from extermination in Syria. They help to defend the churches and mm. the monasteries. Okay. And who are they helping to defend the Christians from? Terrorists backed by America and Britain. That is a very powerful message and a plausible one to spread in Britain and America. Do you think, Ian Williams, that people actually look at these uh, details? <clears throat> I was going to call them fine details, but they're so glaringly loud in terms of what they represent. For example, the fact that Iran has been pivotal in fighting terrorists, especially in Syria. Uh, that Iran, for example, has been a victim of terrorism itself. Uh, back in, uh, I can, I can, we can do a flashback here uh, to 2017 when there were these twin terrorist attacks of which uh, the Daesh terrorists were involved. Uh, you had 17 uh, people who were killed and 43 wounded. Or we can go even uh, forward uh, where you had uh, uh, some uh, 25 people who were killed in a military parade in Ahvaz in Iran. Again, b Iran being a victim of terrorist attack there. Of course, uh, Iran responded and killed 40 of these uh, uh, Daesh terrorists. But yet the, the U.S. putting Iran in a list where al Ghada is. Uh, do people realize uh, the uh, irony here of what the U.S. has done? I'm not sure they realize the irony. Look, a lot of people in the West disagreed with the Syrian regime and disagreed with Iranian support for it. But the Iranian forces uh, carefully stayed away from some of the actions of the Syrian army and put distance. I hope people notice that. Uh, but th the fact is that they have not behaved in a terrorist way. The state-sponsored terrorism is a joke. The biggest sponsor of state sponsored terrorism across the world has been the United States with the CIA and has been Israel with Mossad that's programmed assassinations across the world that's programmed sabotage actions 
And I think, you know, people are much more aware of that than uh, there's this, a folk memory in Britain, for example, that Menachem Begin was an arraigned terrorist who had been killing British soldiers and civilians in Palestine uh, and killing Jews and, and Arabs as well. He was arraigned as a terrorist. And I come back to this point that uh, yesterday's terrorism is today's freedom fighter and tomorrow's president. So I don't really think they're useful terms. But it's quite clear that Iran has not waged aggressive war against its neighbors. But it was wa war was waged against it by Iraq with the support of Britain and America. And I think a lot of people remember that. They remember the fact that a, a, an Iranian airliner was shot down without provocation and with lousy excuses in the Gulf, uh, going to Bandar Abbas uh, for, from, um, by the USS Vincent, who, whose commander actually got a medal for it and was not in any way disciplined. Now, people remember these things, and I think uh, outside of the US, American propaganda isn't as potent because people do see other points of view. Uh, even even in the U.S., it's getting strained now. The the drumbeat, uh, almost I think, if Netanyahu says something, a lot of people are going to assume, like Richard Nixon, he must be lying because his lips are moving. The the, the 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 drumbeat about Iran, Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, etc. The the British were more urbane about this. I'm not quite sure about their current standing, but they used to say that Hamas was a political organization with uh, a, a wing that sometimes commits terrorist actions, which is a bit more nuanced, because that could be described of, of the CIA and the SAS and God knows other paramilitary organizations run by Western states. You could say the same thing about them. Okay, Marcus Papadopoulos, uh, let's uh, elaborate a little bit more about uh, what uh, Iran has done in, in the fight against terrorism, which obviously would uh, um, uh, consist of IRGC <coughs> cooperation in this uh, matter. Uh, and I'm going to go back to uh, what was happening in September 2014. Uh, you had Daesh terrorists, uh, they refer to it as IS or ISIL. They were less than two miles away from Iraq's capital, Baghdad. Two miles. There was fierce fighting that was reported near the capital back then. The U.S. did not. I repeat, did not assist the Iraqi army with this fight at all. And it was Iran that came to the forefront within 24 to 48 hours, depending on who you speak with, but provided the assistance that Iraq needed, which is now, uh, we can see what Iraq is experiencing now. Uh, it what got flushed out of these terrorists. This is probably one of the biggest uh, anti-terror fights that happened in recent memory. <clears throat> is that something that the wider audience in the world perhaps uh, should pay attention to or is aware of? I think that in this day and age, more and more people in the world are becoming aware of the reality of American foreign policy, the reality of British foreign policy, the reality of American mainstream media and British mainstream media. You know, I talk to ordinary British people and American people who now say to me that, yes, CNN is just American propaganda. Yes, Channel 4 News is just British propaganda. Yes, the Times newspaper, the Guardian newspaper is just British propaganda. And of course, you know, the evidence is very, very glaring, glaring. Because, as you rightly said, it was the role of Iran's Revolutionary Guards that helped, that played a crucial role, a pivotal role, in the defeat of ISIS in Iraq. But we can go back years before 2014. It was the Revolutionary Guards that played an instrumental role in preventing the cancerous tentacles of the Taliban from extending into Iran and thereby extending into the rest of the Middle East. Now, you're not going to hear about that in the Daily Telegraph or in The Guardian or on Fox News or on CNN News because it does not conform with the uh, narratives of Washington and London. And I refer also to Syria. Syria is absolutely um, crucial because when the Americans were supposedly bombing ISIS for nearly a year, what happened in that year? Well, ISIS wasn't um, defeated or wasn't reduced in force. Um, ISIS actually spread its control across Syria. But when the Iranian Revolutionary Guards arrived, 
fighting, of course, with Hezbollah and especially the Russian military, slowly but surely they started to turn the tide on Wahhabi terrorism. And as I said, the Christian community owe and are very open about it in Syria. They say we owe so much, not just to the Russians, not just to Hezbollah, of course, not just to the Syrian army, but to Iran's revolutionary guards for our existence. Many bishops, Orthodox bishops, Protestant bishops, Catholic bishops have said that openly <coughs> in Syria. But of course, you won't hear about that in okay. Britain or America because they want to silence that. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're fresh out of time. We have to end it here. Senior analyst at Foreign Policy and Focus, Ian Williams, with his comments from New York, and editor and publisher of Politics First, Marcus Papadopoulos from London. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of The Debate. From Mikhail Vitaway, the entire team in the capital of Tehran, it's goodbye.